Tests of the D'Urbervilles by Thomas Hardy Chapter 2 The village of Marlott lay amid the northeastern undulations of the beautiful Vale of Blakemore, or Blackmore, aforesaid, an engirdled and secluded region, for the most part untrodden as yet by tourist or landscape painter, though within a four hours' journey from London. It is a vale whose acquaintance is best made by viewing it from the summits of the hills that surround it, except perhaps during the droughts of summer. An unguided ramble into its recesses in bad weather is apt to engender dissatisfaction with its narrow, tortuous, and miry ways. This fertile and sheltered tract of country, in which the fields are never brown and the springs never dry, is bounded on the south by the bold chalk ridge that embraces the prominences of Hambledon Hill, Bulbarrow, Nettlecombe Tout, Dogbury, High Stoy, and Bub Down. The traveller from the coast who, after plodding northward for a score of miles over calcareous downs and cornlands, suddenly reaches the verge of one of these escarpments, is surprised and delighted to behold, extended like a map beneath him, a country differing absolutely from that which he has passed through. Behind him the hills are open. The sun blazes down upon fields so large as to give an unenclosed character to the landscape. The lanes are white, the hedges low and plashed, the atmosphere colourless. Here in the valley the world seems to be constructed upon a smaller and more delicate scale. The fields are mere paddocks, so reduced that from this height their hedgerows appear a network of dark green threads overspreading the paler green of the grass. The atmosphere beneath is languorous, and is so tinged with azure that what artists call the middle distance partakes also of that hue, while the horizon beyond is of the deepest ultramarine. Arable lands are few and limited. With but slight exceptions, the prospect is a broad, rich mass of grass and trees, mantling minor hills and dales within the major. Such is the Vale of Blackmore. The district is of historic, no less than topographic, interest. The Vale was known in former times as the Forest of White Hart, from a curious legend of King Henry the Third's reign, in which the killing by a certain Thomas de la Linde of a beautiful white heart, which the king had run down and spared, was made the occasion of a heavy fine. In those days, and till comparatively recent times, the country was densely wooded. Even now traces of its earlier condition are to be found in the old oak copses and irregular belts of timber that yet survive on its slopes, and the hollow-trunked trees that shade so many of its pastures. The forests have departed, but some old customs of their shades remain. Many, however, linger only in a metamorphosed or disguised form. The May Day dance, for instance, was to be discerned on the afternoon under notice, in the guise of the club revel, or club walking, as it was there called. It was an interesting event to the younger inhabitants of Marlott, though its real interest was not observed by the participators in the ceremony. Its singularity lay less in the retention of a custom of walking in procession and dancing on each anniversary than in the members being solely women. In men's clubs such celebrations were, though less expiring, less uncommon but either the natural shyness of the softer sex, or a sarcastic attitude on the part of male relatives, had denuded such women's clubs as remained, if any other did, of this their glory and consummation. The club of Marlott alone lived to uphold the local Cerelia. It had walked for hundreds of years, if not as benefit club, as votive sisterhood of some sort, 
and it still walked. The banded ones were all dressed in white gowns, a gay survival from old-style days, when cheerfulness and maytime were synonyms, days before the habit of taking long views had reduced emotions to a monotonous average. Their first exhibition of themselves was in a processional march of two and two round the parish. Ideal and real clashed slightly as the sun lit up their figures against the green hedges and creeper-laced house-fronts. For though the whole troop wore white garments, no two whites were alike among them. Some approached pure blanching, some had a bluish pallor, some worn by the older characters, which had possibly laid by folded for many a year, inclined to a cadaverous tint and to a Georgian style. In addition to the distinction of a white frock, every woman and girl carried in her right hand a peeled willow wand, and in her left a bunch of white flowers. The peeling of the former and the selection of the latter had been an operation of personal care. There were a few middle-aged and even elderly women in the train, their silver wiry hair and wrinkled faces scourged by time and trouble, having almost a grotesque, certainly a pathetic appearance, in such a jaunty situation. In a true view, perhaps, there was more to be gathered and told of each anxious and experienced one to whom the years were drawing nigh when she should say, I have no pleasure in them, than of her juvenile comrades. But let the elder be passed over here, for those under whose bodices the life throbbed quick and warm. The young girls formed indeed the majority of the band, and their heads of luxuriant hair reflected in the sunshine every tone of gold and black and brown. Some had beautiful eyes, others a beautiful nose, others a beautiful mouth and figure. Few, if any, had all. A difficulty of arranging their lips in this crude exposure to public scrutiny, an inability to balance their heads, and to disassociate self-consciousness from their features, was apparent in them, and showed that they were genuine country girls, unaccustomed to many eyes. And as each and all of them were warmed without by the sun, so each had a private little sun for her own soul to bask in, some dream, some affection, some hobby, at least some remote and distant hope which, though perhaps starving to nothing, still lived on as hopes will. Thus they were all cheerful, and many of them merry. They came round by the pure drop inn, and they were turning out of the high road to pass through a wicket gate into the meadows, when one of the women said, the Lord, the Lord, why, Tess Derbyfield, if there isn't thy father riding home in a carriage! A young member of the band turned her head at the exclamation. She was a fine and handsome girl, not handsomer than some of the others, possibly, but her mobile peony mouth and large innocent eyes added eloquence to colour and shape. She wore a red ribbon in her hair, and was the only one of the white company who could boast of such a pronounced adornment. As she looked round, Derbyfield was seen moving along the road in a chaise belonging to the pure drop, driven by a frizzle-headed, brawny damsel, with her gown-sleeves rolled above her elbows. This was the cheerful servant of that establishment, who, in her part of factotum, turned groom and ostler at times. Derbyfield, uh, leaning back, and with his eyes closed luxuriously, was waving his hand above his head, and singing in a slow recitative, "'I got a great family vault at King's Beer, and knighted forefathers in lead coffins there.' The clubists twittered except the girl called Tess, in whom a slow heat seemed to rise at the sense that her father was making himself foolish in their eyes. 
"'He's tired, that's all,' she said hastily. "'And he has got a lift home, because our own horse has to rest to-day.' "'Bless thy simplicity, Tess,' said her companions. "'He's got his market niche. Ho, <laughs> ho! "'Look here. I won't walk another inch with you if you say any jokes upon him,' Tess cried, and the colour upon her cheeks spread over her face and neck. In a moment her eyes grew moist, and her glance drooped to the ground. Perceiving that they had really pained her, they said no more and order again prevailed. Tess's pride would not allow her to turn her head again, to learn what her father's meaning was, if he had any, and thus she moved on with the whole body to the enclosure where there was to be dancing on the green. By the time the spot was reached, she had recovered her equanimity, and tapped her neighbour with her wand, and talked as usual. Tess Durbeyfield, at this time of her life, was a mere vessel of emotion, untinctured by experience. The dialect was on her tongue to some extent, despite the village school, the characteristic intonation of that dialect for this district being the voicing, approximately rendered by the symbol ur, probably as rich an utterance as any can be found in human speech. The pouted up deep red mouth, to which this syllable was native, had hardly as yet settled into its definitive shape, and her lower lip had a way of thrusting the middle of her top one outwards, when they closed together after a word. Phrases of her childhood lurked in her aspect still. As she walked along to-day, for all how bouncing, handsome womanliness, you could sometimes see her twelfth year in her cheeks or her ninth sparkling from her eyes, or even her fifth would flit over the curves of her mouth now and then. Yet few knew, and still fewer considered this. A small minority, mainly strangers, would look long at her in casually passing by, and grow momentarily fascinated by her freshness, and wondering if they would ever see her again. But to almost everybody, she was a fine and picturesque country girl, and no more. Nothing was seen or heard further of Derbyfield in his triumphal chariot under the conduct of the ostleress, and the club having entered the allotted space, dancing began. As there were no men in the company, the girls danced at first with each other, but when the hour for the close of labour drew on, the masculine inhabitants of the village, together with other idlers and pedestrians, gathered round the spot, and appeared inclined to negotiate for a partner. Among these onlookers were three young men of a superior class, carrying small knapsacks strapped to their shoulders, and stout sticks in their hands. Their general likeness to each other, and their consecutive ages, would almost have suggested that they might be what in fact they were, brothers. The eldest wore the white tie, high waistcoat, and thin-brimmed hat of the regulation curate. The second was the normal undergraduate. The appearance of the third and youngest would hardly have been sufficient to characterize him. There was an uncribbed, uncabineted aspect in his eyes and attire, implying that he had hardly as yet found the entrance to his professional groove, that he was a desultory, tentative student of something and everything might only have been predicted of him. These three brethren told casual acquaintance that they were spending their Whitsun holidays in a walking tour through the Vale of Blackmoor, their course being south-westerly from the town of Shaston on the north-east. They leant over the gate by the highway, and inquired as to the meaning of the dance and the white-frocked maids. The two elder of the brothers were plainly not intending to linger more than a moment but the spectacle of a bevy of girls dancing without male partners seemed to amuse the third, and make him in no hurry to move on. He unstrapped his knapsack, put it with his stick on the hedge-bank, and opened the gate. "'What are you going to do, Angel?' 
asked the eldest. "'I'm inclined to go and have a fling with them. "'Why not all of us, just for a minute or two? "'It will not detain us long.' "'No, no, nonsense,' said the first. "'Dancing in public with a troop of country hoydens. "'Suppose we should be seen. "'Come along, or it will be dark before we get to Stour Castle, "'and there's no place we can sleep at nearer than that. "'Besides, we must get through another chapter of "'A Counterblast to Agnosticism before we turn in. "'Now I have taken the trouble to bring the book.' "'All right. I'll overtake you and Cuthbert in five minutes. "'Don't stop. I give my word that I will, Felix.' The two elder reluctantly left him and walked on, taking their brother's knapsack to relieve him in following, and the youngest entered the field. "'This is a thousand pities,' he said gallantly to two or three of the girls nearest him, as soon as there was a pause in the dance. "'Where are your partners, my dears?' "'They're not left off work yet,' answered one of the boldest. "'They'll be here by and by.' "'Till then, will you be one, sir?' "'Certainly. But what's one among so many?' "'Better than none. Tis melancholy work facing and footing to one of your own sort, and no clisping and culling and all. Now, pick and choose.' "'Shush! Don't be so forrard said a shyer girl. The young man, thus invited, glanced them over and attempted some discrimination. But, as the group were all new to him, he could not very well exercise it. He took almost the first that came to hand, which was not the speaker, as she had expected, nor did it happen to be Tess Durbeyfield. Pedigree, ancestral skeletons, monumental record, and the Durbeville lineaments did not help Tess in her life's battle as yet even to the extent of attracting to her a dancing-partner over the heads of the commonest peasantry. So much for Norman blood, unaided by Victorian lucre. The name of the eclipsing girl, whatever it was, has not been handed down. But she was envied by all as the first who enjoyed the luxury of a masculine partner that evening. Yet such was the force of example that the village young men, who had not hastened to enter the gate while no intruder was in the way, now dropped in quickly, and soon the couples became leavened with rustic youth to a marked extent, till at length the plainest woman in the club was no longer compelled to foot it on the masculine side of the figure. The church clock struck, when suddenly the student said that he must leave. He had been forgetting himself. He had to join his companions. As he fell out of the dance, his eyes lighted on Tess Durbeyfield, whose own large orbs wore, to tell the truth, the faintest aspect of reproach that he had not chosen her. He too was sorry, then, that, owing to her backwardness, he had not observed her, and with that in his mind he left the pasture. On account of his long delay he started in a flying run down the lane westward, and had soon passed the hollow and mounted the next rise. He had not yet overtaken his brother, but he paused to get breath and looked back. He could see the white figures of the girls in the green enclosure whirling about as they had whirled when he was among them. They seemed to have quite forgotten him already. All of them, except, perhaps, one. This white shape stood apart by the hedge alone. From her position he knew it to be the pretty maiden with whom he had not danced. Trifling as the matter was, he yet instinctively felt that she was hurt by his oversight. He wished that he had asked her. He wished that he had inquired her name. She was so modest, so expressive. She had looked so soft in her thin white gown that he felt he had acted stupidly. However, it could not be helped, and turning and bending himself to a rapid walk, he dismissed the subject from his mind. End of chapter 2